everyone. Welcome back to the Fandom Zone podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Charles Skaggs, back in the Fandom Zone, ready to talk more of The Boys Season 2, even more right now, because we've already talked about it. <laughs> so so here at episode 196, I'm joined by my wonderful co-host, wonderful friend, and someone who is very patient putting up with yours truly's nonsense right now, DJ Nick. How you doing, Nick? Hey, Charles. I'm doing well, you know, getting into the Thanksgiving spirit, even though we don't celebrate Thanksgiving over here. You know, we're definitely thankful to be here with you today. And I want to thank you so much for your heartfelt tweet that you, you posted a few days ago. It meant a lot to me, and I'm sure it meant a lot to uh, Zan and Jesse, who I believe you, you name check there as well. So thank you very much for that. Well, you're very welcome, Nick. And being, as you said, Thanksgiving, that I was probably pretty thankful for my wonderful co-hosts like you, Jesse. Zan, of course, who make me sound good somehow, even when I'm <laughs> doing my usual nonsense and really appreciate all of you. And I just wanted to kind of express that right now. It just it was one of those spur of the moment things that, you know, I really should give these wonderful people their props on Twitter. So, well, I'm sure I can speak for Zan and Jesse saying it's more than mutual. I'm sure they appreciate I certainly appreciate you. I'm sure that. That uh, Jesse and Zan certainly do. Well, I know I appreciate all of you. And like I said, I wouldn't be doing this without you guys because you guys are so <laughs> wonderful. All right. Well, and if Zan and Jesse are listening, definitely want to send them a shout out. Exactly. So uh, I understand that Zan sometimes listens to the Phantom Zone podcast. Ooh. So nice. hopefully she's listening. You know, Ooh. she wasn't listening when it was just Jesse and me, but... <laughs> You know, now that you're doing the podcast, well, you know, suddenly maybe it's found its way into her uh, microphone earbuds it's, or something. It's piqued her interest. Just a little bit, yeah. See, it's, it's the appeal of Nick. This is why we brought him on. <laughs> Too kind. So here at episode 186, like I said, we're going to be talking the bloody doles off, which you have to say it like that, right? So this was the sixth episode of The Boys Season 2, aired back on September 25th, 2020, written by Anselm Richardson and directed by Sarah Boyd, who's directed for the show before. And this was a very pretty interesting episode. Before we get into trivia, there are certain episodes of The Boys that, you know, they're, they're fun and they're innovative and, and magical, but... But there's certain episodes that kind of, uh, you know, are more the boys and kind of give it that little something extra. Yeah. And I think this episode is one of those. Very much so. What do you there, think? There's a lot of character development, I think, in this uh, in this episode. I mean, or more than you should say, a lot of backstory, which enriches the characters that are already very well developed. And I think that was uh, it was great to actually kind of take some time to kind of get to know a little bit more of the behind the scenes of how certain characters got to where they are today. Yeah, we obviously learn a lot about boys member Frenchie yeah. in this one, including, hey, he's got a first name, Serge. Yeah. So that's nice, right? You know, we finally get a little bit of background on Frenchie, who's kind of been, you know, not want to say overlooked, I guess, but maybe just more marginalized from time to time. Not one of the major players because mm. we're obviously focusing on all the drama between Butcher and Starlight and Huey and all that. Uh, you know, some of the other members kind of get lost in the shuffle from time true, to time. True, true. I'm glad that we actually found out that he was christened Serge and not Frenchie. Because, you know, folks <laughs> give kids the weirdest names. I mean, you can even check with Frank Zappa. As much as I love Frank Zappa, he gave his kids some really weird names. Um, you mean like Moon Unit, perhaps? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just going there. So, hey, I would not be surprised if somebody christened their kid Frenchie. But yes, Serge. Which valley is girl. She's a <laughs> valley girl. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> and you know what? Because being a Frank Zappa, this might actually uh, tie in nicely with when we get to a certain character later on. But I'm going to keep that here for now, Charles. All right. Sounds good. That's a good tease. But what we'll I wanted to say was um, Serge made me think of Le Beau Serge, which is actually a great Truffaut film. I'm actually a big fan of the new wave or Nouvelle Vague, as they say in, fr in French. So, uh, so it made me think of that. I thought it was nice. Serge is a nice name. Yeah, look at look at Nick parlaying his Francais a little bit here. Well, five years of French at school will have to pay off. I kind of think, you know, my parents would kind of, you know, beat me black and blue. Like you haven't learned a lick of French in five years of school. <laughs> you know. Well, it's good. At least we gave you that that platform to uh, to put that to good use. That's good. <laughs> Thank you, John. All right. So uh, a little bit of trivia before we get started into our topics. 
The Bloody Doors Off title comes from The Boys, issues 66 through 71, which was the final major storyline from The Boys. And as I've we've talked about here on the podcast, that it's another episode title taken from a storyline. And I'm holding in my hands here. Very nice. The volume 12 of the original Boys trade paperback series. So this story, because of its the culmination of a lot of subplots and a lot of other storylines that preceded it, I can't really talk about it because it would be a massive spoiler what happens in this. You know, the boys only ran 72 issues. This covers 66 through 71. So needless to say, this is the climax of the series. So I'm going to have to burn the midnight oil to get there fast. Is that what you're saying, Charles? Since I just started. (laughs) Probably. And probably even more so once I, I kind of tease that, well, hey, this just happens to be the final meeting between Butcher and Huey. And I'm going to just leave it there. Goodbye social right life for me. You granted, we didn't get much of a social life under COVID, but still, that small <laughs> smidge of the social life is gone. <laughs> well, you got anything else better to do in lockdown? I don't think so. At this time, but this uh, time and place, definitely not. So I could probably exactly. just, you know, I'll have to let Rachel and Zan know, not podcasting for a while, reading the boys. See you later. <laughs> there you go. Well, you have to do Phantom Zone. That's that's the only requirement <laughs> I ask. All right. So, yeah, you definitely want to check that out. But I don't want to spoil it. If if you're someone that is familiar with the storyline, you know what I'm going to say. So there's no point in me spoiling it all over again. But if you're someone who hasn't read the comics, you don't want to know. You want to be able to appreciate that moment. So I hope you don't go on the Internet and look this up. Because, for one thing, they may not even follow it. Because sometimes they don't follow the comics here on The Boys. Very true. So it may not even be what... You know what actually happened in the books, so we'll see what happens. But and, and, you but don't if want it, to, and, the, and the chance that it is, you don't want it spoiled. Exactly, you don't want to ruin your reading experience. At least I don't want my reading experience ruined. I want to see what happens. <laughs> there you go. And also, the bloody duels off mm-hmm. was a reference to, and I'm sure Nick knows this because hey, we've already talked about it before. <laughs> of a 1969 comedy film. The Italian Job. So this yep. is the original version of the film. And after seeing his colleague detonate an explosive that destroys an entire van, Charlie Croker, a character played by the great Michael Caine. Yes, indeed. He's fantastic. Known, actor. of course, to Batman fans as Alfred Pennyworth in the Christopher Nolan Batman films. Well, pretty much any Nolan movie, I guess. <laughs> or, or, you know, as Austin Powers' dad. Yep. Or negligent dad, as it yes, turns uh, out. And and Jaws, of course, you know, for you Jaws right. fans. There you go. There you go. Or Inception. Yeah. You had or any other Christopher Nolan movie because he's like his go to actor, right? That's right, yeah. So anyway, Charlie Crooker states in the movie, You're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off in regards <laughs> to that van. Yeah. So that's where the title comes from. And apparently Garth Ennis, it really it was a line that really resonated with Garth Ennis and so essentially this uh, the storyline from the comics was like, well, you're only supposed to blow up a little bit and you end up blowing the whole thing up. So it's a good metaphor, I think. Now, also from the comics, if you're wondering about a certain character that gets introduced in this story, this episode, Love Sausage. Mm-hmm. Yes, we're going to be talking more Love Sausage. <laughs> in the comics, he's a character named Vasily Vaz Voroshinkin. Mm. A Russian ex-cop, ex-tank commander, ex-superhero, communist, and also an owner of a bar in Moscow who has a penchant for a beverage made from brake fluid that he somehow passes off as vodka. So yes, you're Russian moonshiner, basically. <laughs> basically, basically. So so he's essentially like, he's a very gregarious, outgoing character in the comics. He gets along with the boys, very friendly, mm-hmm. uh, kind of like this big galoot to use an American term. And his powers in the comics are that he's, he appears to be super strong and durable, but apparently because of, shall we say, his endowment. Yes, exactly. Being well endowed. Yeah. He's got a little, uh, a pretty large package, shall we say, that he's <laughs> carrying. So he can't run straight whenever he's aroused. <laughs> and apparently he says large female breasts are his kryptonite. So, Mm. yeah, so a very fun character in the comics, but very different here in this episode. 
And we'll talk more about that when we so, talk okay. more love sausage. <laughs> yes, it's always fun to say love sausage. Yes, and, and that's actually where, as I said, my Frank Zappa reference will come into play, Charles. Okay, very cool. Very cool. All um, right, so we have four topics today. Topic number one, let's talk Frenchy flashbacks. Okay. Because we get a, a series of flashbacks in this episode that thankfully relate to the main story as good flashbacks should. And we learn a lot about more about Frenchie in the process, like I said, including his first name, Serge. Yeah. So we probably should run these down. I'm yes. Guessing, so we could talk about them because it kind of covers a certain period leading up to the present day where we kind of find out essentially how Frenchie hooked up with the original incarnation of the boys yeah. and how he met Grace Mallory and so on and the others. So, um, so when we start off this episode, we do the flashback. We have a flashback to eight years ago, where we have Frenchie in his apartment getting high, shock, right? <laughs> While his his mates and possibly fellow members of a certain menage a trois, nicely put, Charles. Sh- yes, Cherie and Jay look on, and Frenchie's going on in a very. Um, Tarantino-esque way about the Golden Girls. Yes. And talking about that kept him going while he was on the streets. So um, I take it, Dick, that you appreciated uh, this little kind of pop culture reference, that uh, pop culture obsession that Frenchie has for this, um, shall we say, you know, standard network television sitcom. Yes. You know what, Charles? I've seen probably one episode of Golden Girls, pretty much. I mean, my grandma yeah. was a big fan of it at the time, but I only actually kind of got to see one episode. But yes, I did look kind of like, if you will, the Tarantino nod, which was kind of fun. The fact that it kept him going while he was on the streets. And you think to yourself, 90s American television. I'm sure right. there are other things on as well, aside from Golden Girls. And I'm sure you, you have a remote. You can switch the channels. Like Twin Peaks, perhaps yeah. that might be what you're hitting at. I'm guessing. <laughs> Not, yeah, g- good catch there. Um, and and actually, it's uh, I loved it. And I think you know it was kind of a Tarantino meets Danny Boyle because once again my train spotting references come in here, and eventually Danny I hope Boyle, we will watch yeah. it. And we will get we will have to. I'm to talk, you know, you and I maybe you no, know, not on the podcast. We will have to talk about your viewing experience of train spotting. Um, but, uh, but I know, yeah. I know, it's on my list. I'm getting, I'm gonna get to it. I swear, I promise. <laughs> I, I will hold you to that. Um, All right, but you uh, do that. <laughs> but yes, it was kind of a Danny Boyle meets Tarantino because obviously these folks are doing nothing all day but getting high. I'm like. How do they get make their income to buy the drugs and stuff? Are they just robbing banks and getting high? <laughs> well, probably dealing as well, I'm yeah. guessing, yeah. on the side. Yeah, because I guess that's what we gathered is uh, uh, Frenchy kind of made his way as a pusher and dealer on the streets and to get where he was at. Because it seems like actually a pretty nice apartment. I mean, okay, it's small, but it seems like a decent apartment. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, and, and I don't think we've ever seen Frenchie sober, to be honest. I wonder if no, he's constantly no, it's... high. <laughs> I yeah, think it's I'm be... high. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, see, now I have to do this because uh, you brought that up. Hold on. i got to go to the soundboard. I think I'm high. There you go. Just for you, Nick. <laughs> Thank you. I had to bring that up. But, All right. But yes. Do you think we actually have ever seen – I think aside from his interrogation, I don't think Frenchie's ever really sober. It's it's hard to say uh, because he's so outgoing. So if he, you know, if he isn't high, I mean, he might be just a naturally kind of upbeat person. Yeah. But but if he is high constantly, that's going to be one hell of a come down, right? That's, Eventually, that's going to hurt. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be pretty brutal. And yes. whenever he ends up going through withdrawal, but. For right now, he seems to be at least he's a high functioning addict, I guess. <laughs> yes, that's true. And we, of course, we get Jay, which you mentioned. And obviously, we don't see him in present day. So, like, yeah, something must have happened to this guy, which is probably yep. why he's not around no more. Yep, but uh, apparently, it doesn't happen in this episode, as we find out. That's right. So, we'll talk more about that here in a minute. So, so that's kind of like our introduction, continuity wise, to. Um, 
to Frenchie. We pick up um, a little bit later. Not sure exactly how far later, but in another flashback, we have Grace Mallory yeah. coming to interrogate Frenchie, who has been arrested and is sitting in a police station. Which and... cuts actually very well from the scene where French is about to break in. They're about to break into the um, to the institute, and French is like, yes. "I never get caught." Flashback to him in cuffs. <laughs> yep. So I guess that was a complete lie. Yes. Needless to say, so she confronts him about his armed robbery charges because, well, hey, they decided, well, you know, we want to go rob a bank. Who wants to rob a bank, right? So it's a, again, it's a very almost Tarantino esque kind of thing that they went off to to rob a bank, and they, he got busted, and so now he's facing twenty five years in the slammer yep. in prison. But Grace, as it turns out, is very impressed with um, Frenchie's engineering ability to counter a soup's power. And so she offers him a way out of this. She says, well, you could you could either do 25 in a slammer or you could work for me. Hmm. And Frenchie doesn't really go for that at first. He denies you know, her offer, refuses it. So she makes him another one. And she threatens to lock up his friends, Cherie and Jay, at a supermax security prison unless he works for her. And this one, he he also kind of resists at first, but ultimately he cares about his friends and he goes along with it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I guess the deal breaker is, oh, you know, they're going to be keeping company with folks like the Aryan Brotherhoods and folks of this nature. I'm like, yes, Jay would probably not do well in the company of the Aryan Brotherhoods. And Cherie, you think to yourself, you know, being a gorgeous, the gorgeous woman that she is, I wonder, you know, if she, her, she would probably be, I mean, I'm sure she can defend herself, but yeah, I don't see her having a good time with those kind of people either. No, orange is the new black, as they say. That's right. She's going to meet up with the, the piper of the situation. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so we pick up a little bit later, I feel say, Five years ago now, so sometime three years after this, yeah. doing the math, we see Mother's Milk showing Frenchie an engagement ring, mm -hmm. telling him that uh, he and his girlfriend uh, are getting engaged. He we plans should... to propose. And so Grace is there. So this is – we kind of see the first incarnation of the boys – uh, that took place, you know, the original team, I guess, before the series started. Yeah, because I actually have the two things to say about this. First off, I'm so glad that Butcher changed his hairstyle as time went on, because there with the kind of licked cow look, it seemed like a cow would give him a lick, and it's like, boof, all back. I was like, that don't suit you, Butcher. He looks much better now. Um, secondly, you know, being of the, you know, part of the Latin culture, because you like him with a little bit of more bedhead is what you're telling well, me. Yeah, I know. Cause I like kind of the spiky kind of look. I mean, I suppose, you know, cause you spiky. kind of, yeah, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, kind of, you have going on that, yeah, Charles, you know, I, I used to do my hair up that the way that Butcher has it now when I was a drummer in a band, I used right. to have hairspray. I didn't know you were a drummer. Yes, indeedy. I used to That's be a awesome. drummer. I used to put. I used to play the drums too. A little oh, bit. really? Very, we'll see. Very, bit. very cool. I mean, yeah, I actually I was in a um, glam rock band for a couple of years, nice. and so I, I had the hairspray and the eyeliner and everything. There are actually, some very embarrassing pictures on Facebook of me in my hair metal days. So, and now um, I need to see those pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're there for the world to see. Um, but yeah, so I was kind of, I kind of had the Billy Butcher thing going on to a certain extent. I mean, granted, you know, we're talking Carl Urban, talking DJ Nick. There's like no, but um, but that's well, it's, it's, it's it's pretty close. It's pretty close. <laughs> but that that said, thank you, Charles. I see that as a very big compliment. But uh, that said, um, it was it was just great to kind of get to see this. And as I said, being of the Latin persuasion, obviously being Italian. You know, the French and the Spanish in Europe are the three big Latin cultures. Mm -hmm. An Italian would have exactly the same reaction, high or not, to the news of your buddy getting married. It's like, oh, big hugs, everybody's going to party, and we're planning the stag party and everything else. That, and that's why I could so relate to Frenchie in that moment, and I loved it. 
when, and that's one of the things I find interesting about his character. You know, he's so likable. Oh, even, yes, he's amazing. Even if when he when he, we talked about this, that he hangs out with so, shall we say unsavory characters. Very much so. Yes, the worst of uh, the worst. The worst of the worst. These undesirables. These ne'er do wells. Take your pick, whatever you want, however you want to describe them. But but he, he you know he seems a little bit more of a uh, an idealist, a little bit. You know that that he has this very upbeat personality. He he seems like he wants the best for the world and for those around him. He re- genuinely for, cares for people. Yeah, and so it's it's kind of interesting. Uh, this character and we it's great to that we're finally learning more about him true in this in this in these flashbacks uh much needed in my opinion so we so while all this is going on a character named lamplighter shows up and this is lamplighter is played by sean ashmore who may be slightly familiar to x-men movie fans as iceman and of course, for you fans of the following as well, he did a great job in that, Sir Charles. I'm a huge fan of that. Are you a fan of the following? Uh, I am not a fan of the following, but uh, my mother-in-law is a huge fan of the following because she is a huge fan of Kevin Bacon, oh. and so shall we say, slightly fanatically obsessed. With Kevin Bacon. <laughs> well, hey, I can't blame him. He is much to the chagrin of my wife, Lori. Well, but... I can't blame him. I mean, he's apparently the biggest hero in the MCU, or so they tell me. So we hear, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but um, so so Lamplighter shows up, and I find it interesting that Sean Ashmore, you know, after playing Iceman, is now kind of playing a more pyro esque. Nice, character. very well played there, Charles. Right? Like that, yeah. So, you know, with the whole lighter and everything. So, so Lamplighter in this, I guess, he, you know, he shows up in costume. So he's got like this torch going, like a very almost druidic. Yeah, uh, medieval, dark age. Medieval kind of, kind of that's, that's a great description. Um, torch that he's carrying in this you know, leather hooded robe, like he's something out of Arrow, perhaps. Yes, I was expecting him to say, you have failed this city. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, right? We'll have a voice so, modulator. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Felicity nattering in his ear, I guess. <laughs> so, so Grace talks to Lamplighter, and apparently, there's a. She's trying to threaten him for some reason that we don't really know about. That that apparently she's trying to arrange that he's gonna. He's a member of the Seven, mm-hmm. and that he's apparently going to tell. Grace and the boys, everything that's going on at the tower, yep. and he's seemingly she seemingly she's threatening him with some photos, so apparently some blackmail photos. Now, being suspicious, Mallory orders Frenchie to follow Lamplighter after he leaves, and Frenchie agrees to do that and races after him. And then the scene kind of cuts, yes. and we kind of shift back to the present day where we find out some more details about uh, what happened, what transpired after that. And apparently um, it's caused a lot of animosity between Frenchie and Grace as a result. Yes, which was actually alluded to, I believe, in season one, because I believe Frenchie brought up the lamplighter story saying, you know, this is going to be lamplighter all over again. And um, so, you know, it teased it so much as like, when do we get to find out more about this Lamplighter character? And Charles, I believe you mentioned that um, that uh, Lamplighter is actually not present in the comics. Yeah, it's it's interesting that yeah, Lamplighter, you know, for he's more of a character that I would probably describe as he's he's more of a frame of reference than an actual character in the comics. People mm-hmm. mention him, mention things that he's done, but we only get to see him here and there very very little in the comics so his presence is felt like a waiting for godot or say even rebecca in the 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 hitchcock film rebecca yeah oh yes yeah i think that's a great comparison seriously um because he yeah he just, he just seems like it's people talk more about him than actually to him 
in the series. So you feel the presence, but you don't see him, if you will. Right. You know, we gotcha. see we we kind of feel more of the effects of things that he's done mm -hmm. more than actually seeing him do those things. So we pick up with another flashback where Cherie, we see Cherie calling Frenchie, telling him that Jay is dying from, you guessed it, an overdose. Of course. What else? Yep. So uh, Frenchie, who, as we remember, is supposed to be following Lamplighter, instead ditches the assignment and goes to be with his friends. Yeah. So he chooses his friends over his commitment to the boys. Once again, a confirmation and, of his heart that is in the right place. Exactly. Exactly. So, which kind of shows you a little bit, though, of a good person that Frenchie is, yeah. that he's more loyal to people than causes. Yeah. Which is good. Um, so, um, but apparently, yeah, so he goes to help revive Jay and we find out that apparently that because he wasn't, he was with Jay instead of Lamplighter, Lamp Lamplighter that night apparently burned a bunch of kids mm -hmm. and the, the whole thing went sideways as a result, creating that animosity because, Frenchie wasn't there to either one stop it or two at least report about what was going on about it. Yeah, and Charles, you know, I obviously, you know, I know addiction is a terrible thing and it can lead to terrible things, but it's almost as an insult to injury after um, Frenchie has revived him with the adrenaline, because of course, any good drug then has adrenaline. Yeah. Yep. Um, but Looking at you, Pulp Fiction. Exactly. Or oh, once again, you're train spotting. But what I think is, is to add insult to injury is we find out that Jay then died three months later of an overdose, which kind of adds, as I said, the insult to injury situation when he could have you know, been elsewhere. And apparently it's been haunting Frenchie ever since. And it's well, uh, you know, he made that he made a good decision. But um, ultimately, it was a kind of a futile result. That, and because the, of that, it's caused this this strain their relationship with Grace and caused that friction now that that the team and especially Frenchie is having to deal with in the present day. But when Frenchie is, you know, has revived Jay and is about to walk out the door saying, I'll be back soon and stuff. Were you cool with what Frenchie did at that point? You know, when you said to Cherie and Jay, I'm out of here, I've got stuff to do. Or would you have... Or were you more in Cherie's ballpark saying he should have stayed? That's a good question, really. Um, I'm more inclined to say that he probably did the right thing. Mm. Now, obviously, the, that's causing some, some ramifications down the road. But I think he did the right thing. And you're thinking, Cherie, it must be a responsible adult. I mean, I don't know how right. high she is at that point either. So, Well, you know... Cherie could watch Jay as easily as Frenchie could. That's why I don't, you know, I mean, as much as I know they're best friends, but I'm thinking, you know, he's like, I'm leaving him in the, I'm not leaving him alone. I'm leaving him right. with, with Cherie so I can kind of go about my business. It's not that I don't care. I'm not leaving Jay to die. There's somebody watching over him. So that was my, I was just wondering, because I'm sure they are, there are people like us who are talking about this who are like, he shouldn't have gone or... He should have stayed. You know, it's one of those. It, it is a a, a, um, a puzzler, if you will, or should we say it's a, it's a conversation piece within the within and, the, the episode. Well, you know, if uh, li any listeners out there listening to our podcast, and thank you for doing so, if you got an opinion on this, why don't you write to us, and we'll tell you how to do that later after we finish our discussion. So stay tuned, right? Because <laughs> we'd like to know your thoughts on this one. We certainly do. All right. All right. Anything else about Frenchie before we move on? I think we're pretty much we're pretty much good with that. I just love the fact that we've got some more bones to this character that is already so loved on the show. And flashbacks done right, Charles. Unlike we're looking at you, Arrow. <laughs> we're just right. Arrow is probably the worst filler episode after filler episode. <laughs> Arrow is probably the worst offender of this, uh, at least in a recent memory, because there were so many flashbacks that were so unnecessary in that show and didn't relate to the present day at all. You're like, this is furthering the plot. How? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it was more like uh, the, the case, and I know we're digressing a little bit, but it was more of a case where they, um, I want to say that they 
it's almost like there were obligatory flashbacks that they felt they had to do a flashback, whether it mattered or not, because that was the, that was their gimmick. He's like, oh yeah, we're on the flashback trend. More flashbacks. Yay. Yay. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And we see how that worked out. Right. All right. So let's move on. Topic number two. Let's talk about the other members of the boys, including Frenchie, mm-hmm. and their uh, encounter with Lamplighter in the present day at the Sage Grove Center, and also running into a character by the name of Love Sausage. So, so uh, yeah, because apparently... Uh, the team's mission in this is to, after getting some intel from Starlight, that Stormfront has, Stormfront's laptop has a bunch of emails between her and Stan Edgar about this facility, the Sage Grove Center, and specifically talking about how they're close to a breakthrough, whatever that is. The team's, team decides, well, maybe we need to go look at this place. Maybe we need to check it out. So they kind of stage an op to break into the facility and try to get some information and also retrieve anything relevant, important, potentially of a blackmail nature, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that could be used to expose their activities. So they stage this op to break in and um, they, you know, with – and it's interesting because the boys do this with Starlight's help. Yeah. So Starlight kind of officially kind of joins the team almost. Yeah. Which yes. is kind of interesting because obviously she's still a member of the Seven. Yeah, this is her first, should we say, assignment on Team Boys, if you will. So, so what did you, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, what did you make of that? I mean, we're going to talk more about Starlight later in our third topic, but... But I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about her interaction with the boys breaking into this facility. It was kind of like seeing uh, for Huey for the second time. Because she is very much, a, in inverted commas, a greenhorn when it comes to stuff that the boys do. Right. And because obviously Starlight and Huey are very similar in that regard. Never killed anybody, clean living, you know, regular stuff, nothing major, etc. And she Which is gets, probably why they got on with each other. No surprise, exactly. I mean, right. opposites attract, but also if you have similar traits, that will attract too, of course. But yes. uh, but it was it was. I, in fact, I was so curious to see how is the newbie going to fit in with these rough and rugged characters who have seen, who have flirted with death and disaster on multiple occasions. So you think to yourself, how's this going to play out? And yeah, to... and Starlight having this Christian background, whether she would be comfortable doing the, shall we say, slightly immoral activities That's... a little bit. And and here's the thing, you know, they're like, okay, Starlight, we've got a soup on our side. She's going to help us out. But here's the thing, Charles. They use her to burn through the um, the gate, if you will, or, or the um, – what's your The mean? fence. The fence, thank you. And, You're uh, welcome. And here's the thing. You see the scorch marks. Aren't people going to say there's no way it's not super it, – it happened uh, supernaturally? You would think unless they – it looked like a perhaps a acetylene torch or something. Yeah, I mean I, unless it's like, oh, this was done by a blowtorch. I mean I don't, yeah. I don't see that, but it's like be discreet. You would think they would figure it out is what you Be you're discreet saying. and everything else is like – that is not very discreet, um, but that's just me. Uh, but but other than that, it was and also you have to think that hey, there are cameras all over this facility, right? That's right. It's like you're not blanking out anything. So something, somebody must have caught something on tape. You would think. You yes, would think. That's right. right. <laughs> but that aside, you know, it was it was interesting to see because we know how Butcher feels about soups. And, it, and yes. we'll talk about this uh, as we progress in the this review. But uh, yeah, I was... think that I think that kind of deserves its own segment. The confrontation, there's because there's kind of a back and forth confrontation throughout the episode yes. between Starlight and Butcher. And, and you wisely decided to make that topic, in fact, because I think it, it definitely deserves talking about. But yeah, and then they get to the uh, to they they they're able to enter, 
And I don't know, I got this kind of Auschwitz vibe, Charles. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I went to that immediately because, like, experiment. Little Joseph of Megala thing going on, yes, perhaps. Look, yeah, the angel of death, looking at the angel of death for sure, because the fact of these experiments on people, burning the evidence, I'm like, yeah. Eugenics, I, yes. perhaps. And yeah. also I went to MK Ultra as well for the super soldiers, you know. Um, so I was like, it's MK Ultra meets... I love that you know that. <laughs> well, I actually got it from the band, from MK Ultra, the rock band. And I was like, that's cool. Why did they, where did they get the name from? Now oh, you know. yeah. It's, and, uh, and yeah, so it was, um, so I, it was kind of like super soldier experiments meets Nazi death camps. That's the way I kind of perceived it. I mean, what did you make of that whole sort of Probably, story? probably along the lines of it. Well, it's the Red Skulls super soldier program. Nice. Yeah, exactly. Yes. What did, I mean, what did you make of that whole sort of? Well, you know, I think it's very interesting because this facility, we, we find out that the, these are kind of, um, Adults that were given compound V, yep, not given, not given it to them as children. So as a result, some of them have very untraditional powers, or they're either not in control of their powers, or they're just um, psychologically unfit to be used as super soldiers or superheroes. Yeah, by Vought. So consequently, they're kind of just kept away hidden away from the world here. The yeah. locked away in a lot of places. And those unfit it's, are literally burnt. Right. And those that are there are kind of also being used as part of it. The continuing experiments, as we find out, to refine compound V yes. and develop it so that it'd be better used by Vought to make more super soldiers, super superheroes. And apparently supervising all this is none other than Stormfront. Right, which should raise like every red flag you have imaginable. Like right? If you thought she was a Nazi. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> right. So yeah, so now she's getting her Mengala on and um it's it's not good, needless to say. So yeah, so so apparently she's she's the one kind of connecting working with lamplighter lamplighter is kind of like the on-site uh person overseeing this program which is why he's no longer officially a member of the seven as yeah, we find out he's now he's now in charge of this facility and in fact because they because i believe it, in fact starlight took his place and they're yes. two characters with similar powers because I suppose marketing wise they have to have the 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 guy or the girl that has the fire powers or the light powers. If light, you know. yeah, exactly, yeah. So I suppose that's why she fit in and took over from uh, from Lamplighter. Yeah, you know, it's it's that whole Human Torch thing, maybe, or or Starfire, <laughs> if you will, a little yeah, bit. I think yeah. so too. <laughs> from from a marketing standpoint, yeah, it probably works pretty well. So. So the team breaks in and um, they run afoul of assorted prisoners. Oh, yes. Including like, well, hey, uh, this one prisoner, Cindy, who breaks out of her cell. And apparently she can just um, just completely crush things with her mind. Yeah, talk about those. Those, she, are, those are killer tele telekinetic powers. That's telekinesis yeah. to the nth degree. Right. So it's kind of like the harsher use of telekinetic powers, right? This isn't just like moving up a, a coffee cup across the room. This is more like, well, hey, I'll just take this guard here and I'm going to just uh, crush him, crush his head. Yeah, just clench my fist. Boom. He's crunch, all over the place. Pretty much. Spooge. And so, so yeah, and there, there's a whole big sequence where Cindy gets out a little bit and Lamplighter's trying to deal with her and pleads with Cindy to let him live. Well, the boys, meanwhile, try to convince Cindy that, well, Hey, we're on your side. You should be working with us and we'll get you out of here. But, uh, but Cindy is like, not sure whom to, whom to believe. But also she point. sees, she sees the suits as well. Cause obviously they are putting costumes to blend in with the, with the staff. And right. she's like, and he's like, you dress because she has obviously beef with lamplighter 
And he's like, oh, you say you're not his friends, but you're dressed like him. And so she obviously, I guess, makes a psychological connection of suits bad. I don't like these people. And that's why she probably right. turns on him. Yeah, she ends up letting the other super prisoners out. And uh, wacky chaos ensues as the, the whole place goes into lockdown mode. And I'm actually surprised this character was invented for the TV show. I know he is. She is yes. not in the comics. She's actually yeah. This is something something different. Yeah. And I know that apparently playing her is like the supervisor of the stunt crew because she's a stunt woman apparently. Oh, and, I didn't know that. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah, uh, because um, I was actually reading a, a little bit of notes about this, and apparently I think she's like the supervising stunt woman in this in the show. And so oh, wow. she, she's a uh, that's and so they they got her to play this character and she does so well. I really like this. It was I don't know why Charles. Maybe it's the shaved head, but it made me think of Hammerhead. <laughs> it made me think of Hammerhead with with powers. You know that that kind of takes us all to our Doom Patrol discussion <laughs> days, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does. on Titan Talk. So. <laughs> exactly. Melancholy so if you want yeah. more, <laughs> check out Titan Talk, the Titans <laughs> podcast. All right. Yeah. So uh, they come across later an acid vomiting patient. Who knocks Lamplighter down, almost melting his face. But Kimiko saves Lamplighter from the patient. So he's like, well, okay, I guess I'll go along with you and get you that access code to get out of here. And so we have another patient pleading with Butcher and Starlight not to let him get hurt. And, you know, so essentially this whole episode turns into a a base under siege episode. That's right. Where we have the characters... Um, as you remember, keep in mind, they're still on mission here. They're trying to get information on the facility. So they end up going to like this security room or something to get, in, uh, in, get some, uh, records or something from there. I can't remember right. exactly yeah. what. And meanwhile, one of the things that, that, that goes on as they're kind of locked away, they end up having this conversation, Lamplighter and Frenchie yeah. about the event that happened in the past. And Lamplighter tells Frenchie that, well, Hey, I didn't know that there were kids in the bed when I set it on fire. Yes, because I was intending to burn Grace Mallory, not the kids. Yeah. And so Lamplighter calls Frenchie out and says, well, you could have stopped me since you were supposedly following me that night, right? And that's where we find out that, no, he was somewhere else. Yeah. Taking, taking care of Jay. Yeah, and that's when also he then reveals to people like Mother's Milk – that that's where he was, and then the fact that also that Jay then died of overdose a couple of months later, and M.M.'s like, why didn't you tell us? You know, it wasn't your kind of cross to bear. You know, it wasn't almost your fault. And right. they have that kind of reveal that that even, regardless of how long French and M.M. have known each other, there's still a lot of things that they don't know about each other, which I thought was an interesting uh, interesting point. Yeah, I mean, it's someone they've been obviously working together for closely for years. Yeah, but but they still have secrets they keep from one another. Yeah, which is a, was an, an interesting one. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, being the boys, being this t- particular TV show, things take an interesting turn. And I know I where you know so exactly where I'm going with mm-hmm. this. So suddenly, as they're locked away in this room. A giant elongated penis breaks through a window and proceeds to choke Mother's Milk. <laughs> oh, Lord. So, so I felt I immediately felt horrible for Mother's Milk that this is happening to him. Yeah. And then we, we find out, you know, this, this is um, – uh, this is essentially the boys' TV version of Love Sausage. So like I said, completely different version. Because uh, back in the comics, Love Sausage may have had, shall we say, certain endowments, but did not have an elongated penis that was stretchable, <laughs> kind of like Mr. Fantastic's or Elongated Man's or Plastic Man's. <laughs> hey, they, they went the extra yeah. mile, literally. Right. This wasn't Plastic Dick, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Plastic Dick. This, this actually that in here is where... My Frank Zappa reference comes into play, Charles, because there is a song from Frank Zappa, which is actually in Italian, called Tengo una minchia tanta. 
which means I have a big penis, to put it cleanly. So, yes, uh, <laughs> Frank Zappa even wrote songs in Italian. Well, I guess, you know, as a callback to his Italian heritage. But, yes. Interesting. That's yeah. Interesting. So, uh, so you couldn't sing that for us, could you? <laughs> no, I could not. I mean, but part of that, it's all recited. Basically, it's him going on for, I was like, Tengo una minchia tanta, and all this kind of thing. Oh, <laughs> interesting. All right, well. <laughs> Great song. I guess he... I guess everybody, you can look that up on the YouTubes and check that out later. I a guess. friend of mine was actually pulled over while listening to that song. So I have to ask, what was your reaction to this? This this moment where a giant penis just breaks through the window. For one, a penis breaking through a window. And then two, trying to strangle Mother's Milk. Okay. Man. Who is a very big, powerful dude. Okay, I have to be honest. I am not a fan of kind of puerile humor, as I've also mm-hmm. mentioned on Next Stop Everywhere, you know, fart jokes right. and what have you. But, you know, and I've actually, but... seen, and I've actually, <laughs> no, I've actually seen stuff this crazy on Scary Movie, if folks will recall. A movie that I absolutely hate, which I was, I, I was kind of forced to watch mm-hmm. in a drunk stupor with folks one evening at a party, and there the is parody, the parody movie of Scream, by the way. That's yeah, right, another right. horror movie. And there yeah. is, in fact, a scene where a penis goes all over the place. And so I'm like, okay, this is scary movie all over again. So you know what, Charles? I just rolled with it. I just said, thank the Lord it's not breast milk. I guess, you know, thank, <laughs> thank God for small mercies, right? <laughs> well, that's true. This episode, we don't get a breast milk reference. So I was actually happy. I'm like, okay, bring on the elongated penis. It's fine with me, you know. There you go. As ridiculous go. as it might be, but but yeah, it's the boys, you know. Yeah, exactly. They top. So, the thankfully, Kamiko pushes through the door, knocks out Love Sausage with a pair of brass knuckles. Yes. So and saves the day, saves MM. So that's good, right? So um so. We find out that apparently at the, after all this, after they escape the facility, uh, Grace confronts Frenchie. And he tells her that, well, hey, I knew that I wasn't welcome at the funeral. But she doesn't care about that at all. All she wants is Lamplighter. Yes. They've got Lamplighter. That's all she's focused on, who is apparently in the back of an ambulance. Grace draws a gun on him. And... Lamplighter suggests that they both be like, let's just get this over with. Let's just, you know, um, he's literally like, put me out of my misery. Right. Because they've been, they've been burdened by this for so long. No pun intended. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. I see what you say there. Right. (laughs) So, um, she'd be doing him a favor. Like you said, now, interestingly, Frenchie speaks up at this moment and begs for Lamplighter's life saying it won't help Grace and she'll just be ending Lamplighter's torment, which causes Grace to lower her gun and wondering what they produce, what Frenchie proposes to do with Lamplighter now instead of killing him. So what did you make of Frenchie standing up for Lamplighter? Well, I, I, you know, I can see both arguments because Frenchie, after I suppose having talked to Lamplighter, because he immediately kind of labeled him as a child killer, because of the mm-hmm. fact that he'd burned these kids. But, you know, then Lamplighter goes out saying, I didn't realize they were kids. Granted, that does not make you any less of a murderer of innocent people, be it adults or children. Of course, you kill children, it's even worse. But I think Frenchie has somewhat understood that he killed these... Because I think what 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 irks Frenchie or what what, what uh, angers him so is that he killed children and he thought he did this almost out of pleasure because he knows people like Homelander who won't right. you know think twice about killing kids if they're in the way and so I can see why he would stand up for him and I suppose maybe it could be the argument of your only what are you going to get if you've killed him what satisfaction is it going to give you right that, that you've, you've killed the guy you know you killed him is it going to bring your kids back? The answer is no. But I think that's the, that's the argument he's trying to make is, do you lower yourself to the level of the executioner of the murderer of your people? It's, I mean, granted, Charles, it's a very open-ended and it, and, and, discussion, but... But again, it's also Frenchie being the idealist here. 
Yes. That, that the, you know, there's a, he sees uh, an alternate solution here. He's not just looking for revenge, interestingly enough. No, exactly. He's like, you know, we can – Because he could just could like could have turned the – you know, like turned a blind eye and let Grace kill him. Yeah, but he did. I think maybe or, – or as you said, yes, he or maybe being pragmatic about it saying we could use a chap like this in the right. grander scheme of things. So it could be both the idealism of you're lowering yourself to the level of the murderer of your family to – this guy has potential. Let's use him for other things to get revenge on the the system, if you will. See, you know, got to listen to the constantly high Frenchman, right? Of course, he's the guy <laughs> with the good advice. Apparently, yeah. Well, it's very Shakespearean. You know, the fool is the one with it who tells the truth. I guess you know to use Hamlet. You <laughs> nice, very nice reference. <laughs> Look at Nick being all sophisticated here with the Shakespearean <laughs> reference. Interesting. All right. So uh, anything else about this topic before we move on? And I thought it was – and part of the fact, I was so happy to see, to see Sean Ashmore again because he is a brilliant actor no matter what he does. And I remember the time going, oh, my God, it's Sean Ashmore. And so I was so happy to see him again. So no, no, I, I'm, I'm pretty much talked out on this one unless you had anything else, Charles. No, I don't. I, okay. I don't. All right, so let's move on. Topic number three, and this is – we kind of teased this a little bit already. Starlight and Butcher, mm -hmm. which I thought, like you, we talked about, deserved its own segment. Certainly does. Because now, obviously, these are complete opposite personalities, mm -hmm. here, Starlight and Butcher. And when Starlight shows up at the beginning of this episode, when she first starts hanging out with the boys in this episode, she goes to their safe house. And knowing that she's being tracked, Frenchie cuts out the tracking chip out of her neck as Huey's looking on. Just like, yeah. And Huey and Annie are trying to pass themselves off like, well, we're just friends now. And Frenchie's not buying it one whit. And he's, you know, working with this cutter to, well, Huey's, you know, trying to keep the bleeding down. Until he finally gets the chip out. Not to mention, Huey can't play it down too much because Starlight's right there. He's like, we're just friends. Oh, no. I mean, I love her. No, yeah. I mean, platonic. No. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's typical Huey. He's very uncool about it. And obviously, he still is showing deep feelings for her yeah. at this point. And I don't think that's going to change. But while all this is going on, Butcher is kind of uh, giving the side eye from across the room. And making comments here and there to the point where Starlight confronts Butcher about, you know, she she starts an argument with him about asking why does he hate soups so much? And she she really gets on his nerves. She tries to push his buttons, really. She tries to compare him to Homelander. You know, before they can kind of continue this discussion, they get interrupted when Stormfront shows up at the facility. It seems like she almost wants to get a rise out of him. Right. I mean, I don't know if that's her intention, but it seems like she's trying to get a rise out of him. Well, you know, Starlight has this very jaded perception of Butcher, knowing how Butcher has treated Huey. Yeah. And Butcher, meanwhile, doesn't like Starlight because, one, she's a soup, and two, because she's involved with Huey. Yeah. So there's this, this butting of heads between these two. And it's not until later in the episode where... After Huey gets injured severely, they're desperate to get him to a hospital. Yes. So they hail down this car to get help for Huey. And the man inside the car gets out, threatens Butcher with a gun, which, big mistake, right? <laughs> yeah. And instead of Butcher doing something about it, Starlight uses her powers to push him away, but accidentally kills him in the process. Mm -hmm. So this is a big moment for her. That she's in accidentally caused this human's death. She's lost her virginity, if you will, when it comes to to the killing thing. I, I have to use that reference, Charles, because I mean it's uh, it's what I, I know. That's what came to mind. It just like Huey in season one, right? Well, or to use uh, a certain title from a uh, the first boys' major storyline, she kind of lost her cherry when it comes to killing. 
That's what right. I say. <laughs> That's right. And so it's like, yeah, she's lost her virginity. And no surprise, her reaction is similar, if you will, to Huey's. Granted, okay, Huey's just like in total shock. I think she's masking her. I mean, initially she, she says, you know, in the car, I would have cried. And, you know, had it been some time ago, I probably would have broken into tears. She seems to uh, internalize that moment. Right. Yeah. Well, I think by this point, she's, after being sexually assaulted by the deep. And knowing what she knows about the And seven. knowing what she knows, you know, conf- being confronted by and threatened by Homelander, mm-hmm. that she's lost a lot of her naivete. It's almost like another day at the office for her, almost. Right. And interestingly, and it almost seems, this is something that kind of gets addressed in this episode, that in a weird way, Butcher and Annie kind of bond with one another because they kind of have a, they kind of find common ground here. Talking about Huey. They t- and, and in a lot of ways, they're a lot alike, as it turns out. True. And even though it initially Starlight points out that um, Homelander and uh, and Butcher are not so different, you know, she yeah. says what has been on the minds of a lot of us viewers is right. you and Homelander are not so di- are so different. Kind yes. of, uh, two sides <laughs> of the same coin. It's curious that they seem to be bonding over Huey because obviously discussing the little anecdotes about. The fact that Huey uses children's shampoo or that he uses right. axe. And hey, if she says that's what uh, Vin Diesel smells like, I mean, tell Vin Diesel that he uses axe and he, <laughs> he, he's terrible. I mean, I wouldn't uh, muster up the courage to tell Vin Diesel he uses a bad uh, deodorant. Seriously. Right. <laughs> but, but Maybe you could email him in from, from a distance. I don't know. It's like, axe sucks, Vin Diesel. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of generally known that Axe sucks, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Axe, don't sue us. So, um, but but it's kind of weird because they bond and, and they kind of come to this agreement that, well, neither of them is good enough for Huey. Yeah, because I see that, Huey's the good person in the in right. All these it, yeah, and, and, and you know, obviously, we talked pre in our previous episode. We talked that Butcher has an affinity for Huey because he's kind of like his brother. Yeah, that's right. And Annie feels that, you know, she, because of her experiences, maybe she doesn't deserve to be with Huey. Yeah. Even though she was just as noble and I think still is just as noble as Huey, if you will. But she feels, I think now that she's almost tainted, having experienced what she experienced with the seven and having just recently killed somebody for the first time, she maybe almost feels tainted compared to Huey. Granted, Huey right. has actually killed people himself as we've seen in the previous season, but, but, but also I don't think uh, Annie has seen that. She hasn't seen him kill anyone. And he hasn't possibly told her. Right. So, so maybe, uh, you know, that'll come out eventually. We'll find out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, maybe they can help one another with that. You never know. Just you never know. Thing. Just stay tuned. But but I thought it was very interesting, these two. Um, and uh, it, the, the, it's kind of weird that this accidental death actually brings these two to at least a some sort of um, common ground, like I said, some sort of... Let's see, more like a compromise, I guess, where they were they they kind of a detente, if you will. Well, she's kind of almost earned her boy's cred in the eyes of yes, Butcher. The street cred, yeah, the street cred, yeah, exactly. And and not just because of the death, but the way that she's processing the death and and handling it. Yeah, because had she maybe gone you know fallen to her knees and and cried, Butcher yeah. probably would have not given her the time of day. But the fact right. that she processes it the way she does in the car and everything else, I think, uh, yeah. It's, a, it's almost like she earns a little bit of his respect. Yeah. And in fact, she actually calls him on it saying, you don't look at me like that with kind of awe and respect. I don't want that look. Yeah. But he's still giving it anyway. Yeah. I guess. So so it's uh, it's kind of a, a mutual understanding that they reach here. And we'll see where it goes. 
Yeah, because you could certainly turn the tables on how Butcher views soups. Yeah. That not all soups are bad. But now it's also a question of, well, how does this accidental death, this accidental murder, what's the ramifications? Have, what? Is, what? How does it affect Annie going forward? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we'll see what happens. All right. So anyway, I just thought that was uh, something we should really focus on for a little bit. It was. All right. Topic number four. Let's talk about, you guessed it, Homelander. Wouldn't be a boys discussion without Homelander. Of course. And this season's certainly not one without Stormfront. Yeah. So our two crazy kids, after hooking up <laughs> in the previous episode, well, our literal power couple decided kind of um, – you know, they're they're kind of in the throes of whatever it is that they're doing. I don't want to call it love, lust at this point, perhaps. Maybe it's love for Homelander and maybe not so much for um for Stormfront, but we'll get into it. Yeah, we'll see how it plays out. But so they go do what, you know, a super powered couple does. They go fight crime, right? So they catch a robber initially as the episode begins. And they uh, they kind of flirt with one another while they're debating about what to do about this bad guy. Yeah, she's happily groping him. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much. She's feeling him up, um, stroking his genitalia through his pants, and Homelander, understandably, getting quite aroused by this, and apparently to the point where, as he climaxes. Homelander crushes the robber's head. Yes. And so blood sprays all over him. Again, remember, this is the boys. So comes to the territory, right? Of course. So blood is spraying all over them. And, you know, obviously in a direct metaphor for what just happened. Of course. And um, they just continue to make out and get – Stormfront gets really turned on by this to the point where they start having sex in an alleyway. In the same alleyway. Well, I guess still the old, covered in blood. Well, I guess the older dodge of sex and violence probably here is probably probably uh, yeah. is suitable. Yeah. So so obviously things are going famously with these two right now. They're doing they're just fabulous, right? Oh yeah. Point. What a couple. Yeah. I'm sure it'll turn out well. <laughs> of course. Right. <laughs> no big deal, right? Um. So. Later, though, while Stormfront is off at the facility, as we found we were talking about, uh, while it was under siege, Sage Grove, and she kind of uh, helps to kind of take out some of the unruly patients that get start escaping. Mm -hmm. While this is going on, Homelander kind of feels a little abandoned. Well, because she kind of blows him off because he's like right. – I've got something to show you in my trailer, and she probably, you know, she reads it as, you know, I want to have sex with you again in the trailer kind of thing. I think that's the way she reads it. She yeah. says, I have a surprise for you. And she's like, you can surprise me all over the place when I get back kind of thing. So he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's nothing It's nothing they can't wait till later, right? Yeah, because she's thinking it's just another rough and tumble in the trailer, if you will. Oh, when the trailers are rocking, don't come a knocking. <laughs> well said. There you go. Sounds like a country song, right? It does. <laughs> All right. So Homelander, not really dealing with this well, burns down his trailer in anger. Well, not to mention he actually had a whole bouquet of roses set up. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he was just trying to do this big, nice, romantic gesture for her. It yeah, was like, thank you for a wonderful day, uh, hugs and kisses, yeah. Homelander. So he's like, wow. Yeah, you know, something very lovey-dovey. You know, something not so violent, bloody mess kind of way. And he feels rejected at this point. So because of his emotional immaturity, he lashes out angrily, burns down his trailer. So Stormfront finally shows up. Homelander accuses her of lying. Claims that, uh, well, she claims like, well, I went to meet with my social team. Yeah, and so the tower. She, and the tower, so she lies to him about the facility. She's keeping that from him. And, you know, Homelander says, well, I went to the tower, but you weren't there. 
So he gets more and more annoyed with her to the point where he starts choking her, but then he stops himself. Yeah. So things not going that well at the point at this point. And you almost see a concerned look on on Stormfront's face is like have I got, am I in too deep or should I say, am I, uh, am I in over my head with this right. relationship? If we can call it a relationship. Yeah. So, so what was, uh, you know, this rather sudden relationships kind of hits the rocks pretty quickly. They hook back up later at the very end of the episode when Stormfront joins Homelander in her apartment and he's refusing to hear her apology mm. at this point says, well, I'll tell you everything from now on, and shows him a photo of her and an elderly woman that she says is her daughter, Chloe, who apparently died of Alzheimer's a few years ago. Yeah. And this is where we get the, the much-needed backstory here that in confirmation of what we all suspected, right? That she was born in 1919 in Berlin, you know, this would be like roughly at the end of the World War, at the end of World, World War, War I. One. Yeah. Yeah. So that would make her over 100 years old. Pretty much. And she was with Himmler and Goebbels. So there's a good crew to hang out with. That's fun people. Exactly. Party, right? And she uh, apparently she met Frederick Vaught, who married her. And gave her the very first successful V injection, compound V injection. And they fell in love. Frederick gave her a daughter. And uh, apparently his genius was what later made Homelander. Right. And then she so, espouses on the whole thing of Homelander being their savior. And is it any surprise that Homelander is blonde and blue eyed? It's the Aryan Superman. Yes, exactly. So, so apparently she's all in on Homelander. All this, you know, if if you kind of, he, she doesn't come out and say it, but you kind of piece it together that she was writing him to put him in a situation where she can manipulate him and bring her into, bring him into her confidence. Yeah. So, Homelander is not sure about this, but. Um, Stormfront says, well, you know, we're in a war for the culture. This is where she gets her full racist on here. She says the other races are grinding them down, but they can attack or fight back with an army of soups. Yeah. So that's apparently her plan. Yeah. It's to start this like super powered race war. Because, then, hey, race war isn't enough, right? we got to add superpowers to it. Well, I mean, that also, of course, plays into the whole national socialism narrative of the Ubermenschen or the Supermen, right. if you will. Yes, exactly. So Stormfront tells Homelander that he could lead them, and he's everything that they've dreamed of. Like you said, he's the Aryan archetype, right? It's everything, the blonde hair, blue eyed, exactly – you know, what the they super, want. The Superman. Their ideal. Yeah, exactly. The Ubermensch, right. So this is why she says she's in love with him. And now they neither of them have to be alone ever again. And they reconcile at this. Yes. Which I I was so hoping that he would actually break her neck at that point. I yeah. was actually going, do it, kill kill this this hussy. <laughs> Seriously, do it now. <laughs> Um, you know, one of the first a few times. I'm guessing I, there was stronger language involved when yes, you said that. Yes, as yes. I said, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 down, I'm watering it down big time because this is there not drunk go. cinema, so I can't. No, uh, no, 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 can't no, let no, loose. No. But I was like, kill her already. I was just hoping for his eyes to suddenly light up and blast her right. head off. But, no. but remember, we still got two more episodes to go, so we can't kill her yet. Well, not to mention she, you know, she mentioned Goebbels, who was, of course, uh, the head of propaganda for the National Socialist Party, and so a smooth talker and a silver-tongued devil. And she is just a silver-tongued because she plays into his ego. I think as soon as she says, "You were born to lead us," she's playing his song. She literally took a nickel, po popped it in the jukebox, and is playing his song. 
Well, like I've talked, you know, talked about, she's a master manipulator. Yeah. And and obviously she learned a few things from old Herman. Exactly. Hanging out with the head of propaganda. Yes, I guess it rubbed off on her. Yeah. Go figure, right? Yeah. So uh, talk about a social influencer. <laughs> yes. More like a Nazi social influencer. But, you know, there you go. Uh, so that's where we kind of leave off the episode. Although we do get a little postscript uh, where we find out that Stormfront had tried to kill Cindy earlier in the episode by electrocuting her. Only she survived. That's right. And we see her hitchhiking along the highway. So presumably we will see Cindy again. Yes, that spells trouble. Right? <laughs> I'm sure that'll go well. Oh, of course. It'll go it'll go swimmingly. <laughs> exactly. Right. So all right. Anything else about this episode that we overlooked? The other thing that I thought was 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 interesting was seeing, of course, the deep hookup with A Train, and we see that they mm-hmm. still have somewhat of a brotherly bond because, like, hey, brother, how you doing? You know, kind of hugging each other. And I, I think it's more of a one sided though. I think the deep wants to hang out with A Train. Yeah, but A Train doesn't really want to hang out with the deep. I, I, I suppose so. And then, and then, you know, of course, he's like, "Do you want a fresca?" And as you told me, I've never tasted fresca. And, and a fresca. I, yeah. And I suppose if somebody offers you fresca, I don't know how whether it's good news or bad news. But um, he's like, "Do you want a fresca?" And so off they go to the the church of the collective. Side note: Apparently, Zan Sprouse likes fresca. Oh, good to know. <laughs> yep. So, uh, just putting that out there. So. I'm okay with Fresca, but it's not exactly my favorite. So I would rather drink, hey, Sierra Mist, like I'm drinking right now, there you go. or 7-Up or Sprite. So just putting that out there. But yeah, but. so we get basically A-Train being taken to the Church of the Collective and meeting up, I think, with the head honcho of the head of the, of the Church of the Collective at this yeah, we, very we fancy get, dinner. We get introduced to a certain Grand Vishnik as mm-hmm. Alistair Adana, the head of the church. Yeah. So, so, and someone who may be a little more important as in the next couple episodes. We'll see. All so right. I, so that was interesting, yeah. And then, of course, the other thing I wanted to also mention was um, uh, uh, Maeve and uh, and her oh, girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, because you know, they finally discovered the – they didn't find the black box uh, from the plane, but they find, I think, the mem- memory drive or the flash drive or whatever – or the yeah. footage – from there, yeah, it was like a, it was not like a, a camera, a camcorder kind of thing that the deep, uh, because of the wreckage being underneath the ocean, presumably went to go down because of his ability was able to swim down there, retrieve the camera. Yeah, exactly, I talked to a few of my connections. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and so we see some spoilers. Of the- they're fish. <laughs> yes, and I so talked to see- some fish, and we see some of this found footage and we can see that it could be very damaging you know, of course for homelander and it doesn't seem to work well for mave's relationship either no it doesn't because apparently they've uh, elena her lover yeah. finds out about it she's naturally understandably horrified by this but mev says well you know i've got some plans to uh, blackmail homelander to so that he'll leave them alone or else she'll go public with it. Yes. Yeah, like I'll give this to CNN if he doesn't leave us alone or I believe, yeah. I believe it's CNN, but, but yeah. And so, but it's kind of left there because we don't know how things obviously are resolved between Elena and Maeve when it comes to this big reveal, but we know that the footage is there, which of yeah, course could so play a big role. It's a, uh, yeah, it's probably pretty important. Yeah. So obviously it's another, you know, another pawn on that chessboard to be played so we'll as, we, as we get to the last two episodes of this season mm-hmm. exactly all right so uh so that's our episode do you have any favorite quotes oh well i actually had one which which really kind of stuck with me which was actually frenchy to mm you know talking about the latin yep. happiness it's like the bachelor party i will throw you what's your stance about transgender strippers and mm's like strippers ain't really my kind of hershey's with or without nuts <laughs> I, I had a feeling that as we went through our discussion that you were going to use that quote. So that's good. Yes. That was, that was hilarious. That was, that was pretty funny. You know, and then Frenchie's the other like hugging him and yeah, just like 
hey man, we're gonna get that bachelor party. It's gonna be great. And yeah. so, what about very you, infectious. Charles? Did you have any? Uh, let's see. Yeah, Starlight. Uh, when she first comes into the um, the kind of sanctuary, the the safe house, and she's like looking around, going, "This is where you're living." Talking to Huey, and Huey's like. Yeah, it has its charms. The rats are like Pokemon with Hep C. <laughs> that made me think of my my friends who actually play Pokemon Pokemon Go, but he really not. Yep. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Zan's big into that, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're talking a lot about Zan this episode. I you know, how probably her ears figure. are burning at this point. I, I hope she's listening. Now I really hope she's listening. You better be you listening. Know, we're talking Zan. about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pressure's on. Um, Butcher to Huey, I thought had a good line where he said, never go into shark infested waters without chum. <laughs> that was a good one, too. Yeah. Do you have any others? No, I'm, I, that was pretty much the one that stuck out with me the most, to right. be honest. And then lastly, I'm going to say Starlight to uh, Billy Butcher. Pretty, uh, pretty interesting uh, conversation here. She says, the only good soup is a dead soup. And Butcher replies to that, your words, not mine. <laughs> yeah. Knowing knowing how or what we all know how Butcher feels about, about superheroes. So yeah. Ask Becca how he feels about superheroes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, right? Right. All right. Um and you know, music we had we did get a couple of nice little musical moments. One disturbing when um Homelander and uh, Stormfront got it on to Happy Together by the Turtles. Yes. And then also, thank you for being a friend, I believe it was, at the end. Yep, that that was the Golden Girls theme. Yes. <laughs> by the way, that, that was a nice touch, right? And then uh, Orinoco Flow by Enya. Was a, Which a was moment. very weird. I mean, I love Enya, but uh, there was like, I'll never be able to listen to Enya again without thinking of the boy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what's your rating for this one, sir? I'm going to give this eight and a half exploding bodies. Nice. Well, I'm going to go a little higher than you on this Ooh. one. I love this episode. I thought it was a lot of fun. I give it nine out of ten love sausages. <laughs> that works, I reckon. <laughs> All right, so Phantom Zone News, I just have one little thing to talk hmm. about. Uh, just really quickly, got some word that apparently Black Lightning will be ending with its upcoming fourth season. A little sad about that. Yeah, so am I. Really enjoy, really enjoy that show. Apparently, uh, it's going to get replaced, though, by a painkiller spinoff. You know, the spinoff that nobody wants. Seriously? Seriously. That's the plan. Wah, wah, really? Yeah, exactly, right? So yeah, the, this, that kind of deserves this, as far as I'm concerned. So. Yeah, epic fail on their part. Yeah. I'm sorry. No offense if you're, you know, no offense to anyone no, if you're no, a no. painkiller I mean, fan. Of course, cool character, but of all the 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 DC superhero shows I want to see, painkiller would not be high up on the list. I, in fact, I, I mean, you know, really, Greg Belanti, you can do better. Yeah, pretty much. Unless, unless I'm kind of one. I've been thinking about this a little bit. And I've been kind of wondering. I want to get your thought maybe on this. Yeah. I think all the quote unquote good superheroes are now being saved for HBO Max. Aha, yes. And Berlanti is only getting the leftovers, shall we say? It's either true. They're kind of like, eating either. his lunch. That's, that's I mean, they are. I mean, they, to be fair, they are getting Superman and Lois. Yeah. But, you know, with with rumors that uh, this may be the Flash's final season. Everything's moving over. Everything's there. kind of sh everything's, you know, shifting away. Things are changing. Yeah, you know, Supergirl. Green Supergirl Lantern got replaced. Coming up. Right. So I'm just kind of it's, you know, I, I kind of wonder what like notable sh t superhero shows are going to be added to CW at this point. I think anything that's, that's really anybody, anything that anybody's really looking forward to is probably going to be appearing on HBO max instead. 
Yeah, it makes you wonder where 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 Greg Belanti is going to go from you know from here on out because it's almost like scraping the barrel at this point. Um, you know, Greg, move your head literally to yeah. find something interesting. To, right. To, to well, they didn't. You know, they do. They are going to have Star Girl, which they picked up from which Geeks is a fantastic Universe. show. It's a fantastic show. And that's a great show. Uh, we talked about it. You know, here on the Phantom Zone when Jesse Jackson was my co-host talking about that. So. No problems with that. That's a great show. But it makes you think: where does where does Mister Belanti and, the, and his team go from here with the transition yeah. from the CW but again, that to was, HBO? But again, that was a cast off from DC Universe. Mm-hmm. So the question is, you know, what what new big exciting thing is is um, the CW going to add at this point? I mean, unless Painkiller is an overnight sensation, I and mean, it could be. It could be. To be fair, I mean, it could. Be popular, but, um, I, but I coming kind of off think Black that the, Lightning, it is. Uh, it's quite judging a, by the judging by the Twitter reaction I saw when the news broke. Uh, I don't think it's going to be anything anybody's really looking forward to. I have been, as I said, yeah, but maybe also you know coming in from it, you know, just not even maybe watching it. Folks might even almost refuse to watch it because they might be scorched by yeah. having lost Black Lightning. Right. They might be pissed off, essentially. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So um, just thought that was interesting. Do you have any other – anything else news-wise you want to add? Well, uh, Charles, I don't know if we mentioned this, but, you know, what about uh, – because I heard that, well, in the movie-verse, Wonder Woman coming to uh, to TV screens in uh, on Christmas Day, if I am not uh, wrong, or Christmas this Eve. True. Yeah, this was, a, this was a nice little Christmas present we got from Warner Brothers. Yeah. Was the announcement that, hey, just like you know, Milan appearing on Disney Plus, Wonder Woman is going to be brought to HBO Max, their streaming service, and even better than Mulan, it's not going to be um, a premium pay to pay. It's not, pay it, it's not yeah, it's not going to have an additional charge on top of the hey, the amount of money you're already paying for the service. You HBO know, like it Max- should have been. You know, like it should have been for Milan. I, I agree. That. I'm actually going to watch it on Disney Plus next month because it'll be yeah. free for Disney Plus folks. Yeah. Um, but yes, you guys they, get Wonder Woman 1984 next month. And they are going to be releasing it in theaters, although I don't know what theaters are going to be open, considering how our COVID rates are skyrocketing yeah. out of control. Very true. So um, – well, I know what you'll concerned. be watching on Christmas Day, Charles. Exactly, exactly. So, and oh, by the way, my wife Lori and I have already made our plans because we'll be spending the day with my parents. Mm-hmm. But in order to watch the movie without like a billion questions from my parents, so that we, you know, so we can actually hear the movie, yeah, we're going to be safe. We're not telling my parents that it exists, and we're going to go home and watch it on our TV Fine. later that night. Yeah. So, so we can actually enjoy it. Well, I mean, I'm so looking forward to this, and you know, it's uh, no it's offense a, to my parents, but no, you know. no, but I mean, you know, come on, it's Gal Gadot and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yep. it's, it's, and then later, after we watched it once at least, we'll t- we'll let uh, I'll I will have it on for my parents and let them watch it. Well, there you go, exactly. Yeah, so I, I think that's a pr- that's some pretty cool news. Is you know, you get Christmas with Wonder Woman. And uh, so, so it's, uh, it's that's, that's not too bad, right? Oh that's no, pretty... it's nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> yeah, like I said, it was a wonderful Christmas present from Warner Brothers. So, <laughs> yes, I like so, that, that, that 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 play on yep. words there, Joel. It was a it was a wonderful Christmas time <laughs> gift. Yeah. All right. So, um, do you have some fan mail from Dave Proctor? Yay! I want to read, read that real quick. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for writing in. We really appreciate it. So he writes in about the bloody dolls off says, digging out Starlight's tracker was disturbing. How did they get it in there? It's a good question. True. Maybe, well, I mean, I would think she was probably aware of it, right? Unless they knocked her out. But... I suppose. Not to mention the medical staff when they took it out was worse than the ones in Inglorious Bastards. Because there's like no sanitation whatsoever. <laughs> it's like, yeah, out. right. <laughs> it's out. Homelander and Stormfront going after a criminal and handling it in the most disgusting way. These two need to be put down. Ooh, rather harsh judgment from <laughs> from Dave there. 
I kind of agree with Dave. I have to admit. Put him down like a dog. <laughs> All right. Starlight called Butcher on his bigotry. So often, people don't see their own bigotry. That's true. Yep, that's true. Lamplighter. Frenchie really wants that guy. But now all the patients are out. Mayhem erupts. Yes, it does. Mm-hmm. Yes, it did. Except when you don't need it, Starlight's batteries go dead. Yeah, I guess you needed an energizer. I guess. Yes, in fact, Butcher even calls, like, you know, that's such a yep. crappy power. <laughs> right, right. Uh, the Deep tries to recruit A-Train. Tesla, no, Alistair Adana. I see what you did there, Dave, because <laughs> Goran Vizhnik, who played Alistair Adana, also played Nikola Tesla in um, the uh, – uh, was it the Nikola, – Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror, Ooh. the episode yeah, of Doctor, Doctor Who. Who. Yeah. I was trying to remember the exact episode title there. Um, get it there in a minute. You know, a little slow tonight. That's all right. That's all um, right. By the way, happy uh, 57th anniversary, Doctor Who. Yes, indeedy. So, uh, but uh, we'll save that for another podcast. This, mm-hmm. is a, this is the Phantom Zone podcast, although I am wearing a Doctor Who t-shirt today. And it's and, a beautiful t-shirt that our dear yeah. friend Charles is sporting there. Very yeah, nice. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the Who's. Yeah, exactly. it? it's the Who's. Yeah, exactly. Because you got like Paul McGann as a Roger Daltrey. You've got... Um, Tom Baker is uh, Pete Townsend. You've got David Tennant as Pete Best. And um, I think you got over here, you got Matt, Matt Smith. Smith as John and, and Whistle. Yeah, so. it's a beautiful t-shirt. There you go. All so, right. Yes, happy birthday, birthday Doctor Who, for sure. Yep. Happy birthday, Doctor Who. All right. And uh, Dave continues. Uh, the head of the uh, church is eager to have another recruit. Have some Kool-Aid. Yep. Or oh. Fresca. <laughs> Maybe it's Kool-Aid flavor, flavored Fresca I don't know yeah. All right. We get a little peek into the history of Lamplighter and Butcher I think I think he may, probably means that Lamplighter and Frenchie I'm mm. guessing But it's alright Starlight is having a difficult time realizing that good people Sometimes have to do bad things True I just hope I don't have to kill anybody in this lifetime Yeah, yeah and I'm not planning on it Personally So <laughs> Um, anyway, although, you know, obviously you get tempted, but no, you're not going to do that. <laughs> All right. It's not good. Got to be the hero, not the villain, guys. Amen. All right. Uh, I love it. I laughed at this. He says, prehensile penis, ex- question mark, exclamation mark, question mark, exclamation mark. <laughs> prehensile penis. Yeah, prehensile to penis. Yep. <laughs> Very alliterative of you, Dave. Very clever. Yep. Starlighter and Butcher finding common ground. That's one of the things I pointed out. Mm-hmm. Lamplighter has remorse and may be a bit suicidal. It's a good question. It's a good observation, I think. True. That's fair. And lastly, he says, so Stormfront comes clean to Homelander, and they start making making out to the Golden Girls theme. Is it this because she is older than dirt? Yeah, she is over 100 years old. They are. Yeah, she is. But it's also a nice callback to Frenchie. Of course, the, the little Tarantino the talk, chat about the Golden Girls, of course. Yeah, so he closes. Keep up the good work, work fellas. Stay well. So thank, thank you, Dave. Thank you very much, Dave, and I hope you and yours have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Exactly, and I, I second that emotion, sir. So, yes. Uh, hope you and uh, your loved ones are well, and uh, hopefully you have a even better 2021. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, if you want to be like Dave, and please do, write to us at Phantom Zone Cast on Twitter, Phantom Zone Cast on Facebook, Instagram at Phantom Zone Podcast. We would love to hear from you. Please like and follow us, share the links if possible, because obviously we'd love to grow our podcast and get more listeners and uh, more people contributing to the discussion. And hey, sharing is caring, right, Charles? Exactly. <laughs> I love what you did that. All right. I love that you did that. So, Nick, where can they find you and all of your wonderful work? Well, when it comes to me, first off, I'd like to say we've heard from, from Dave Proctor. I want to hear from Gamble at some point. Ooh. Da-da-da. Really? <laughs> yeah. 
We heard from Proctor. Where's Gamble? You know? I see what you did there. Proctor um, and Gamble. They're very good. Very that, good. That, that said, uh, when it comes to me, I'm I, sure he gets that joke all the time. I, right? I know. I'm sorry, Dave. I didn't want to add to that because I'm sure you probably got it a lot. But you know, when it comes to me, I do host a whiskey and cigarettes show where we play traditional country, today's country, and everything else in between. For more information about that and where we can, where you can tune into the show, you can visit our website. Um, also, podcast-wise, I do host the Happiness and Darkness podcast, where we discuss superhero movies from Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, Image, and more. If you'd like to join me to discuss your favorite superhero movie, you can email me at happinessanddarknesshow at gmail.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Also, I do ho- or co-host the uh, Gold Standard, the Oscars podcast with Zan Sprouse and Rachel Friend. We're discussing all the movies from um, that won the uh, Oscar for Best Picture from 1927's Wings to Present Day. If you'd like to join us to discuss your favorite Best Picture win, you can email us at goldstandoscars at gmail.com. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. And what about you, Charles? Well, as for me, of course, at Charles Skaggs on the Twitter machine. At Charles Skaggs on the Instagram and Facebook, Charles Skaggs in Hilliard, Ohio, and my blog of geeky things. Damn good coffee and hot. Damn good coffee and hot, where I talk about all the stuff we talk about here on the Phantom Zone, including The Boys, Stargirl, Watchmen, all kinds of comic book sci-fi news. News of my other podcasts for the Southgate Media Group, including (gasps) Deep Breath, where I talk... Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast, where Jesse Jackson and assorted wonderful special guest companions join us, including a certain DJ Nick, this past week, where we talked Aliens of London, World War III from the Christopher Eccleston era. So you might want to check that out, listeners, if you haven't already. If you have, thank you for doing so. And in addition to Doctor Who, we also talked Torchwood, the Sarah Jane Adventures, Big Finish Audios, and more. So I hope everybody checks that out. And once again, hey, happy 75th. Or excuse me, happy 57th. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Sorry. I was in the future 18 years down the road. It was a, it was a good year. Trust was me. that a Trust good me. anniversary, the 75th, Charles? The 75th anniversary was fantastic. Absolutely <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> All right. And then also Ghost with the Twin Peaks podcast they do with Zan Sprouse where we talk all things Twin Peaks, David Lynch, et cetera, et cetera. And right now, we didn't get an episode out this past week because, sadly, Zan was feeling under the weather. So we did not get our Criterion rundown of our, of the Criterion collection of The Elephant Man as we had planned. So hopefully we'll be doing that here shortly. So thanks for your patience. And then we'll have to figure out what to talk about after that. So we'll see what happens. But any suggestions, drop us a line about what you'd like us to talk about on Ghost with the Twin Peaks podcast. And then Titan Talk, the Titans podcast, which is kind of on hiatus right now as we wait for Titan Season 3 and Doom Patrol Season 3. We did get the reveal of Starfire's costume today. Indeed we did. And Charles, I'd actually also like to take this moment, you know, having the honor and pleasure of being uh, a Titan talker. And I want to thank everybody for just liking the, the Facebook page because it's, it's enjoying so much love of late. And I want right. to send a big thank you out to everybody who's supporting the Titan Talks podcast on Facebook. It, it means a lot to, uh, I'm sure, to me and I'm sure as much as it does to, just, to, to Charles and Jesse. So thank you for these con- this influx of likes when it comes to, to Titan Talk. It seems to be a very interesting global phenomenon, isn't it? Indeed. I've just been watching it. I'm like doing my stuff on Facebook. I'm like, Time Talk got another 20 likes. I'm like, wow. You know, they really yeah, I know. It's, over there. It's pretty good. So, yeah, we definitely appreciate it. So if you, if you listen to us on Titan Talk, in addition to the Phantom Zone podcast, we really appreciate you and uh, all the likes and support. Because uh, we're like almost like heading toward 300 likes on Facebook, if I recall correctly. Yes, and we're very, very great. Which is pretty, pretty impressive as mm-hmm. far as I'm concerned. All right. You guys are awesome for doing that. Yes, indeed. And then lastly, I want to mention Drunk Cinema, the unexpurgated podcast that I do with Zan Sprouse, where it's pretty simple, really. We watch movies together as a kind of commentary style fashion, and we drink adult beverages and have adult language and discussions. And if you've listened to our very first episode where we watched Batman 1989, you know, that was a pretty interesting discussion that we had (laughs) as Zen got a little too carried away a little bit. She wasn't drinking Fresca. (laughs) She was not drinking Fresca. Exactly. That was a very special Fresca on that one. (laughs) 
but it made for a great podcast. Trust me. I hope everybody that listened to it enjoyed it. We're just a brand new podcast, so everybody would definitely appreciate it if you uh, liked and follow us on the show, social media and also shared our links and encourage your friends to check us out. We definitely appreciate it. And coming up in episode two, we'll be discussing Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which is a particular, it's one of my all-time favorite movies. Zan, uh, if you've heard us on Ghostwood, we, we kind of do the Ferris lines a lot. Yes. A lot of references. So so this is kind of one near and dear to our hearts. So we're starting off pretty strong. We did Batman 1989, then Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And we've got a nice little list here that I'm holding, top secret list <laughs> of things that we're going to be coming up with planned for the near future. So I hope everybody checks it out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Great fun, great fun. Folks, definitely check out – if I may, I, folks, definitely check out Drunk Cinema because Charles and, and Zan just provide with so much entertainment. I thought it was hilarious, to be honest. When I was actually doing my shopping, Charles, I was listening to you yes. guys, and I was kind of almost laughing when I was getting some of the folks like, do you have a condition, son? Are you okay? <laughs> I was laughing while doing stuff, but yeah. Uh, there I was, but yeah, it's hilarious. Well, that's you know that's the point. We were trying to just entertain people and have fun and and, and hopefully make you laugh. So if if we did that, we did our jobs. And the world needs a laugh in this day and age, unfortunately. Pretty much, especially right now. So it's nice to know that our drinking was not in vain. <laughs> All right. So I hope everybody checks out us on Drunk Cinema next time on the Phantom Zone, though. Episode 197, we are going to be talking Butcher, Baker, Candlestick Maker. And in this one, Congresswoman, Congresswoman, excuse me, Victoria Newman, schedules a hearing against Vought with Lamplighter as the chief witness. Ooh. And I'm sure that'll go well. Of course. It's the boys. How can it not? Yep. <laughs> Homelander and Stormfront manipulate Ryan, and Maeve and Elena break up over that rather uh, awkward videotape. So uh, we'll see how that plays out. Plus, much, much more. Ooh, yes. Nick, I want to thank you especially tonight because you were kind enough. We were having, shall we say, Charles was having some technical difficulties <laughs> in forgetting to uh, start the record button as we were, got about maybe a third into the podcast. So, Nick, I want to thank you so much and publicly thank you for agreeing to restart the episode and get us all hopefully recorded as long as mp3 skype recorder doesn't screw me over tonight well charles it was a pleasure heck i saw that as a dress rehearsal you know we're kind of like rehearsing it's like, okay we're good to go shoot the you know start shooting so it was all good and it's such a joy as always to podcast with you you know i suppose even though as i mentioned we don't celebrate thanksgiving over here the spirit of thanksgiving has permeated me as well and so i'm super thankful to you for having me you know, on and joining you in this great discussion. And a big, big thank you to our listeners out there for supporting us. It means the world. So just thank you all so very much. And, and of course, Charles, you know, thanks again for you know, thinking of me and having me join you. Well, I certainly can't add anything more than that because you pretty much summed it up perfectly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I hope you know, you're, you're more than welcome to share our Thanksgiving, however virtually it may be. But we consider you one of our family. So at least know that we, you know, we want to share our thanks to you as well. And we have to hope that the year coming up will be a much better year for all of us. Here's hoping for sure. Yeah. Stay safe out there, folks. Yeah. Be thankful for our health. Be thankful for our safety. And in the meantime, though, then come on back for episode 197 as Nick returns with me to talk Butcher Baker Candlestick Maker. I think it's going to be a lot of fun as we hit the penultimate episode of The Boys Season 2 as uh, we're building to that very special climax, only without a love sausage. <laughs> Just keep that out of your mind. And then we'll see you next time right here on the Phantom Zone Podcast. Goodbye, everybody. Ciao. 